Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jagdish. I'm in the School of Environment and Sustainability at the Indian Institute for Human Settlements. Um, it gives me great pleasure to have you all. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you are located. And uh, uh, just uh, as a brief introduction, uh, this is a, a webinar on nature-based solutions in cities. And uh, it is part of a collaborative uh, project uh, between the Indian Institute for Human Settlements and uh, the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and Environment. And it is supported by the agency Frances Day Development. And uh, this is a webinar we have brought together a uh, very interesting group of uh, panelists. And uh, just as a brief introduction, um, we are, uh, the, the title is um, about uh, cities being in a fix and whether nature is a solution. And the term nature-based solution itself uh, suggests that uh, there is a problem and uh, we are uh, drawing upon nature to help solve it. So when we talk about problems in a city or an urbanizing space, it could be because of, of, um, of excessive uh, heating, because of the heat island effect, because of uh, climate warming. It could be the uh, flooding because of, of the way in which we are managing our water cycle in the cities. It could be the deteriorating water quality. It could be um, the loss of our groundwater resources because of lack of recharge uh, whenever rainfall happens. Uh, it could be the loss of uh, of our ability to uh, to um, to have uh, biodiversity on in the, in the urban space that leads to various types of problems. So you have uh, a solution uh, to various types of urban problems, um, and I've just mentioned a few. And then we are drawing upon uh, the functions that uh, different types of green and blue. Uh, infrastructure or spaces or habitats can uh, help provide and also drawing upon the biodiversity itself, the flora and the fauna, uh, especially native species, uh, as well as species that, that people uh, can benefit from to find solutions for some of our urban problems. So that's the, that's, that's the, that's the context. So now I'm going to introduce this very interesting panel we have. So uh, we have uh, Parama Roy. Uh, she's trained as an urban geographer. Her research interest lies in the multifaceted and complex nature of urbanization process and its social and environmental implications in sectors of food, water, and waste. Uh, and she's particularly motivated by uh, the concepts and the practice of social and environmental justice uh, in relation to sustainable development. Currently, she's working at the Okapi Research and Advisory in Chennai and also holds an adjunct faculty position at the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. Since 2019, she has been working closely with the Chennai Resilience Center as a research um, and advisor primarily on Chennai's urban farming initiative and urban ocean program. So uh, welcome, uh, Parama. Uh, our next panelist uh, is uh, Seema Mondoli. She's a faculty member at the Azim Premji University. She has been working in, the, in Bengaluru's uh, sustainability issues for a long time. She enjoys exploring different aspects of urban uh, sustainability and nature-based solutions, and has constantly been asking um, and trying to find answers to the role that nature can play in making cities more sustainable um, and also more equitable. And so these are some of the questions that have been driving her current uh, research, outreach, and teaching interests. Um, our uh, third panelist is Chetna Kasika. Uh, she's a senior research fellow at the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and Environment Atri, Bengaluru. She studies uh, the bee community in and around Bengaluru. Uh, that's been her passion. Uh, she's interested in understanding how bees and other pollinators navigate the complex urban and uh, urbanizing landscapes and how what can be done to make cities better for uh, for bees 
as well as for people who coexist with bees. She leads the Bee Garden Project, a citizen science initiative, where she has set up bee hotels for solitary bees uh, across Bengaluru to gather information on these cavity nesting bees and also to foster engagement for pollinator conservation. Um, we were originally going to have uh, Saskia uh, from the Indian Institute of Science, Center for Ecological Sciences uh, to join us. Uh, unfortunately, because of a health emergency, Saskia is not able to join this uh, webinar. Um, so the final panelist we have is uh, Ravi Jambikar. He's a e ecologist and a naturalist and an artist uh, at the Indian Institute for Human Settlements with the School of Environment and Sustainability and has been working on, on uh, butterflies and then more recently on birds and other aspects of uh, natural history and also fostering uh, the uh, our uh, the role of of citizens in in conservation in Bengaluru. So I'm very happy to have this very distinguished and interesting panel. Um, so what I would uh, I would start with is uh, have a, a sort of a set of introductory statements uh, on the role of nature in the city and the role of nature based solutions in the city, uh, drawing upon your different aspects. So it's just a, a very brief opening set of remarks from each one of you. So I'm going to start with the uh, Parama. Hi, thank you, Jatish. Um, so you've already given an introduction, so I'm not going uh, into my current position. Uh, but uh, one of the things that you've already mentioned, I'm actually closely working with the Chennai Resilience Center. Uh, here in Chennai, uh, which is essentially a wing of Care Earth Trust, and it's uh, funded by um, Ashrock. Um, it's a long name, uh, essentially Adrian Ash Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center in the US. Uh, one of their flagship projects that they are involved in is around uh, urban farming in the city of Chennai. But before going into that, I, I think it's uh, it's important to sort of situate myself and, and explain that my engagement with nature-based solutions really started back uh, from the time of my PhD days, when essentially I was looking at the distribution of urban forest uh, in the city of Milwaukee. And I was looking at it from an environmental justice perspective, who has access and who doesn't. And in that process, I uh, came across these various community-based uh, gardening and farming initiatives uh, in the city, specifically in inner city neighborhoods where, uh, you know, minority populations were really using these as strategies for uh, building the community, building uh, youth leadership in the community. And of course, at that same time, uh, these gardens were also providing a range of other ecosystem uh, services in, in, in terms of uh, access to nutritious food, etc. Uh, so from there, I have continued to work on urban greening strategies uh, being used as means of urban redevelopment and uh, urban renewal in different uh, geographic contexts. And uh, what is interesting to me is that when I started working on urban greening initiatives, these were not necessarily recognized as uh, nature-based solutions or even green infrastructure. I think the, the entire practice and discourse uh, of uh, nature-based solutions and green-blue infrastructure has uh, re really evolved more uh, in the recent times. Uh, but currently, as you mentioned, I'm uh, involved in this practice-based project uh, that Chennai Resilience Center is leading. It's called the Chennai Urban Farming Initiative, and we call it QFI program. Uh, I'll give a very short uh, introduction of this program. The, the idea of the program is to essentially uh, introduce nature-based solutions uh, in the form of rooftop gardens or on-the-ground vegetable gardens, primarily targeting low-income communities in the city. So what we are really uh, trying to do here is to introduce these decentralized green spaces, which range you know, anywhere between 50 to 1,000 square feet or so. Uh, and these spaces are being set up in public schools, in daycare centers, homeless shelters, uh, low-income neighborhoods, resettlement colonies. So again, as I said, the focus is a bit more on um, marginalized communities. And the idea is to use these decentralized green spaces as uh, ways to mitigate urban heat, 
uh, and at the same time provide access to nutritious food and provide possibly job opportunities to the urban poor. So there are uh, various verticals that we are trying to touch upon uh, through the same program. And that's really the essence of nature-based solutions. The reason that we really value nature-based solution is because of the fact that it uh, you know, it simultaneously sort of touches upon uh, multiple benefits and not just uh, one specific thing. Um, and what the CRC program is currently doing is it's trying to help uh, these communities set up these green uh, spaces, but also, uh, you know, try and help these beneficiaries maintain and and, and train them to become self-sufficient at the end of the day. So, um, again, I think we are also heavily involved in monitoring and evaluating the program. So we are actually finding out how these spaces are playing a very important role in the city in terms of mitigating heat, in terms of access to food. But I'm hoping we'll get more opportunity during the session to talk about those uh, details. So I'll just uh, wrap up and give others the opportunity, but also highlight that uh, you know while we are proud of the initiative and, and talk about all the positive thing that is coming from that initiative, the fact is that uh, there are also very many practical challenges associated with uh, just maintaining and sustaining these uh, nature-based solutions. So hoping that we'll get into some of those discussions as well in the rest of the session. Thanks, Chakti. Thank you, Parama. Um, now I would like uh, Seema to step in and give a set of opening remarks. Thank you, uh, Jagdish, and uh, hello, everyone. It's uh, really wonderful to be here. So I am, uh, as Jagdish mentioned, I'm a faculty at the Azim Trimji University, but uh, I'm also a part of the Center for Climate Change and Sustainability, which is a, a unit within the research center at the university. And uh, uh, we do, a diff our research is focused on communicating about uh, climate change, um, and each of us have our own areas of research. And this whole idea of nature-based solutions actually came up because of a question that we were asked in a journal when we submitted a manuscript to a journal. So we had, sub we had there was a research which one of my students had initiated in the East Kolkata wetlands, uh, which as many of you may know, it, 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 it's, it's this uh, wetlands to the east of the city, which has a historical timeline whereby the British had introduced, uh, uh, had, had seen it as a site for dumping the sewage and waste into the, uh, of Calcutta city as the city grew into it. And uh, from the students' work, we took it on uh, to uh, see how the local communities were dependent on the wetlands for their livelihoods, uh, like fishing and farming. And, and we, we did the usual research, we did the interviews, we submitted the paper, and we uh, said uh, using the ecosystems framework, because this was a whole set of services that were being provided. And we said, look, this is a nature-based uh, service. So one of the questions that one of the reviewers asked us was that uh, this is a existing uh, feature in the landscape. So how can you call it a nature-based solution, which made us again rethink and go back to the idea uh, of, you know, is nature-based solutions just a buzzword when it comes to uh, countries in the global south? Uh, especially in India, because NBS in the developing world involves some kind of a building of a green infrastructure. It could be like a vertical, uh, which is that famous Bosco, one of the buildings in Italy, which has like a vertical forest. So what are we saying? And why are we saying that this is an NBS? It, am I saying it just because I want to use it as a framework for publishing a paper? Or is there really any relevance for it? And and at the center, we are very clear that the research we do has to have some kind of a public uh, uh, relevance, a, a practice element. So we went back and we thought and we did a few more interviews and we realized that uh, uh, the, in, in, if we have to ensure that NBS is not limited to being seen just as a buzzword in cities, but is actually uh, encouraged and used by planners, so why is the wetland today being seen as a real estate rather than as a place that can uh, uh, that can treat the waste of an entire city without building a sewage treatment plant, uh, provide uh, uh, food for the city and a lot of uh, states in the Northeast uh, from its farming and fishing. Uh, and then how do we then look at ecosystems in cities in India as nature-based solutions and how do we argue for it? 
So that is essentially where we started looking at it. But traditionally, yes, we have looked at uh, nature in the city, in nature in cities, and how people engage with nature in the cities, the benefits that it has, and this was one more dimension which could help us push the idea a little more effectively when we are talking about it with with gov with say a government official. I would say, look, you don't have to invest money in building an STP, acquiring land, if you have a wetland that is going to be performing the same service. So uh, it's through that that the uh, whole uh, engagement with NBS has become. And then uh, I had the opportunity to attend uh, a, a, a kind of a very close group workshop in Cape Town, where exactly these kind of questions were being asked, not just with regard to cities from the developing world, but also in the, from the developed world, like, the, like we had the faculty from Stanford who are asking the same thing, you know, like uh, how do we make NBS more effective when it comes to finding solutions for sustainability, keeping the angle of justice and equity always as a priority. So uh, that's how this whole uh, uh, engagement is started. And yes, I personally am at the beginning of this journey of trying to uh, know more about it. So it's great uh, to be here and also to learn uh, along with the others. But I'll stop there. For Thanks, Seema. Uh, now I'll uh, ask uh, Chetana to, uh, to give us uh, her perspective on this topic. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Jagdish. Um, so, as Jagdish uh, mentioned earlier, um, I am Chetana Kashikar. I work with ATRI, and uh, my team and I have been involved in looking at uh, pollinators, especially bees, in um, urban and urbanizing landscapes. So, um, I think our foray into this field uh, started with our interest in studying how bees uh, respond to urbanization. So um, I'm sure all of you know that um, bees are one of the most important group of pollinators here. And they're sort of at this interesting nexus. So there's biodiversity on one side, there's also um, food production and nutrition on one point. And there's also um, the fact that um, a lot of uh, food crops that bees pollinate can be grown in urban areas. Um, you know, they don't have uh, huge space requirements like, say, you know, rice and ragi, but um, they can be grown in smaller spaces. So that's why uh, conserving pollinators in urban areas is so interesting uh, because it, it, it ticks so many boxes and it's connected to all of these components. Um, I'd also like to very briefly talk about the really important role that uh, pollinator-mediated foods have when you talk of uh, nutrition and well-being. Because um, it's quite interesting that most of these food groups that are very uh, micronutrient rich are actually pollinator dependent. So um, uh, most of your fruits, vegetables, oil seeds, nuts, spices, all of these need pollinators. So um, this, is, um, this is why we're very interested in looking at bees. So initially we looked at um, bees across a landscape. So we looked at bees in rural areas, in transitioning areas and in urban areas. And our findings were quite surprising. Um, we see that uh, urban spaces can support lots of different kinds of bees, that they seem to have a fairly good bee species richness. And um, also the fact that urban spaces are very interesting because they have lots of different kinds of um, vegetation. So these uh, plants provide floral resources for these bees. So it became quite apparent that um, urban areas have good scope for uh, uh, conserving bees. And um, we were also interested in what this meant for urban agriculture and uh, edible gardening and food production. So, uh, so I think I'll talk a little more about these projects later on, um, but I'll very briefly mention um, what we're currently doing. So um, as Jagdish mentioned, um, we are um, currently in this ongoing study on uh, solitary bees, which are also cavity nesting bees. And this is the bee garden project. Um, through this project, we uh, basically want to do three things. So the first thing is, of course, we want to conserve bees. So bee hotels provide nesting space for bees. So when you set these up, um, bees find uh, these wooden cavities and spaces where they can make nests. 
And this is very useful in a place like Bangalore or in any other city where it's hard to come by dead wood. So that's one thing. And it's something that everybody can do. So whether or not you have a sizable garden space, you can still consider setting this up. Um, it'll help the bees surely um, in, in over time. Uh, the second thing that we want to do via this uh, bee garden project is uh, generate data. So uh, what is really um, you know scary is that um, bees and other insects are, uh, are not studied across spatial and time scales that much. So if I were to give you an example, um, the IUCN, um, it assesses the status of every animal, every bird that we know, right? So in contrast, IUCN has been able to assess the status of just 0.8% of the insect, insect species that we know exist. So that's really, that's um, that's very, very less. We know very little. So through this project, we want to collect data on what bees are there in Bangalore, um, what are the landscape features that seem to affect them, and just basically get some you know, useful data out that we can use as a stepping stone. And thirdly, um, this is a citizen a citizen science based project. So we want to engage people through this project and sort of uh, not just uh, spread awareness. We want to get people interested in these. And I think that's very important because um, only when you know or recognize something can you um, really appreciate it. Uh, so that's also what we're trying to do through our project. And um, I think we can discuss more about this as a nature based solution now, later on. Thanks. Thanks, Chetna. Now, over to Ravi. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, as compared to other panelists, I'm very new to this field. Even though I have been working in the field of ecology and animal behavior uh, for quite some time, uh, nature-based solution uh, thing is very new to me, and I started... Uh, doing more applied or uh, practical uh, kind of nature-based solutions on the our IHS uh, campus. And uh, like last, uh, since last year, we have been trying out a lot of different practical things uh, like setting up uh, bee hotels, which Chetna mentioned, or putting up owl boxes. Uh, so the there is a problem uh, on our campus that... Uh, it uh, has a lot of we grow uh, we practice agriculture and uh, there are a lot of rodents and pests but we didn't want to uh, use chemicals or uh, pesticides to control these rodents so that's why we put up a uh, owl box on our campus which was occupied uh, by spotted owlets and that is our way of controlling uh, the rodent problem uh, so these are the kinds of different solutions uh, that we are applying on the campus and my knowledge comes from the natural history uh, part of it, like uh, where, where we can use these uh, nature-based solutions, um, where they'll be viable, which environments or which animals can be used to control the pests. So um, that is uh, my uh, take on uh, this and um, for the future thing we are uh, synthesizing uh, a review of few studies that have been done uh, in the global south and we are asking the question that will these nature-based solutions help uh, conserve biodiversity or uh, help uh, maintain healthy populations of wild animals uh, in urban areas. So that is an ongoing project which we have just started and um, we are reviewing literature for that. Thanks, Ravi. Uh, all of you have uh, provided such a diverse and uh, interesting set of, uh, of topics and issues that uh, um, I will have to straddle a lot of area here to engage with all of them. But I am going to start with uh, with uh, a, a question for uh, for all of you, but uh, but certainly for Parama and Seema, since both of you have mentioned uh, 
uh, environmental, social environmental uh, implications, but also in relation to uh, environmental or ecological justice issues. And uh, just like any other system of, of conservation or restoration, uh, nature-based solutions uh, can also have uh, implications for uh, um, uh, in terms of, of uh, environmental or ecological justice issues. We have seen that uh, there have been some evidence from different parts of the world which are emerging that often the burden of uh, implementing certain types of solutions uh, to address urgent environmental problems in, in, in cities uh, sometimes comes at the cost of people who are at the margins or happen to be living or uh, or uh, or uh, having livelihoods linked to certain spaces in 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 and around the city so examples include uh, the implementations of sponge cities where which can actually displace people um, also um, in the when the yamuna floodplain was now you know after so many decades of degradation and encroachment by so many different agencies and and so on Finally, when it came to uh, to looking at solutions for for conserving the rest of the floodplain, uh, the the burden came on the farmers who were actually in in the floodplain uh, who were perform who were doing agriculture. And then there was a Supreme Court order, and then there was a pushback against that. That actually we should be looking at farmers in the floodplain as a part of the solution to restoring the Yamuna floodplain rather than seeing them. Um, as as an impediment for that, when you have had so many other demands on the floodplain uh, without any hindrance for decades, and and then finally you find one group of people to to uh, to displace or or to so that is that is one issue. So there is a, there is a, this aspect that nature based solutions are, by definition. Uh, they have to be scalable. They have to be replicable. Um, they have to, of course, uh, promote native biodiversity. Um, and, uh, and of course, now uh, considerations of equity and uh, social and environmental justice also have to be, uh, to be connected with nature-based solutions, even though they're just emerging in many parts of the world. But it's the right time for us to think about these aspects as well, because like, like, like any other conservation endeavor, they can have um, disproportionate negative impacts on certain sections of of, of people who happen to be uh, there uh, uh, when when these things are being implemented. So I just want uh, any perspectives from Parama, then Seema, and others are welcome to to uh, contribute as well on uh, on on this this aspect and whether it is something that is is a serious enough issue that we have to grapple uh, with uh, sooner than later. Yeah. Um, so I'll go first, Seema. Is that okay? Yeah. Please do. Um, so, um, so it's, it's really one of those very tricky questions because whenever we think about nature-based solutions, um, our, you know, the, the color that we see is green, everything green, everything nice, positive. Uh, but essentially, we also have come across situations where uh, these nature-based solution-driven uh, urban design projects have ended up greenwashing to some extent and leading to environmental injustice uh, situations. So one of the, and I know there's no simple answer, uh, but one of the ways I try, or I at least think about reconciliating between uh, you know, going for these solutions and how do you also at the same time ensure that it's not environmentally uh, unjust to any specific uh, stakeholder group is to think about the connection between, on the one hand, uh, the importance of the nature-based solution, setting up something, restoring something is easy. Maintaining it is the challenge, right? And that's where I feel that working very closely with the existing stakeholder groups, and that is that should definitely include the include the most marginalized ones as well. But they are the people who are using some of these existing landscapes, whether we are talking about a wetland, for instance, uh, when you talk about or try and get into a wetland restoration program. Uh, there are existing population living in that area using that space already for some reason or the other. Uh, you might call them encroachers. Uh, some of them might be actually using the space for their livelihood or for living. Uh, I really feel as soon as we start thinking about these different stakeholder groups as potential people who can help us maintain these spaces post implementation of the program, uh, that's when we'll start seeing value in them rather than just thinking about them as, as the problem population. 
And it's very unfortunate that you know, when there are encroachments from not just the lower income uh, communities, but also other kinds of you know, so-called legal developments that also encroach upon our wetlands, our uh, floodplains, uh, essentially, as Jagdish, you were mentioning, that the brunt really falls on specific groups of people. Uh, so in many ways, I feel like uh, this issue of um, injustice in the way we go about uh, restoring our wetlands or in the way we go about thinking about uh, NBS-driven projects, uh, I think we really need to recenter the different stakeholder groups, including the most marginalized ones, as part of the project, as how do we uh, sort of ensure that they're empowered in the process, but also at the same time, perhaps leverage their existence in those spaces for uh, future maintenance of the space, because we need these people to be part of that landscape, to take care of that landscape. Um, another angle I just want to quickly add to this whole discussion about uh, being just, and this is coming from uh, sort of inspired by the Urban Farming Initiative. Uh, again, our uh, the Urban Farming Initiative that we are involved in, um, to a large extent, focuses on uh, lower income communities. Um, so it is specifically targeting the lower income communities. One of the things that we have uh, found out over a period of time, we have learned, is that when we are working with uh, some of these communities, we have to really uh, put at the front of everything the hierarchy of needs of those communities. We need to recognize what is it that they really need. Um, so we can't like top down go in there and say, you know, we are going to put up urban gardens if, if it doesn't make sense to them. Uh, oftentimes, you know, the, the most successful cases that we have been able to uh, set up are in places of... Uh, for instance, ICDS centers where the teachers really quickly see the value of these gardens as sources of food, as sources of medicine, as a space of education, whereas where we have not seen these uh, some of these activities uh, being very successful are resettlement colonies where you know people's needs are very different. Uh, they they are more you know these are people again unfortunately who have been shifted away from floodplains and have been resettled 30 kilometers 20 kilometers away from the city so uh, you know poverty lack of jobs uh, lack of basic services um, crime high crime levels addictions those are the issues they're dealing with so there uh, although access to nutritious food and jobs might be one of the entry points for them currently the, the scale of the gardens that we have cannot address uh, those, you know, their, their needs at that scale. So it, it doesn't, so unfortunately, in those spaces, for those communities, these nature-based solutions have not been able to appeal or, you know, get that kind of ownership as it has in some other places. So I just feel like when we talk about equality or making these uh, initiatives just, uh, at the center of designing any of these projects should be the thought of hierarchy of needs. What is it that community really needs? So I'll just stop there. Uh, thanks, Parama. Uh, Kasima? Yeah, so uh, this is uh, this is a very, uh, as uh, Parama said, quite a complicated question. And uh, one of the things that we have been uh, thinking about, so uh, recently uh, we had our, let me plug the book, Shades of Blow, uh, a new book is out for us. And there are two chapters, one chapter is on Calcutta and one chap chapter is on the Yamuna where we had done uh, field work with the people, exactly the what you mentioned, the farmers who are uh, growing food on the banks of it. So, so one thing that comes out and we think of that and nature-based solutions is that by the definition of nature-based solution says that it has to be scalable. Can we think of nature-based solutions in cities in India as also being very, at the same time, contextual? So to, to explain that, an argument in Calcutta to use whether the wetlands come into the picture is economic, an economic argument. Most people who live in the city of Calcutta don't realize that that wetland is heavily subsidizing not only their food, but also their waste management. So in the case of, and, and I know that the economic argument has many, uh, people usually balk at the idea of giving an economic argument when it comes to nature. And I, I would too when it comes to say, putting a price on trees that are being cut. But can we be strategic in terms of when you're converting these wetlands into real estate, you are depriving more than, uh, I think there are about a million people there who depend on livelihoods 
uh, you are uh, cutting off access to the uh, city uh, food uh, food supply food is going to get far more expensive and also you will have to build massive sewage treatment plants if you want to clean the city calcutta does not have to spend uh, infrastructure on building those plants so in the case of uh, calcutta that can we strategically use that as an argument when it comes to delhi obviously it's a capital city and uh, for all whether we like it or not for all the reasons yamuna has to the, the the banks of the yamuna need to have some kind of an aesthetic appeal now that aesthetic appeal uh, in addition to all those whatever ghastly constructions uh, that are happening on the banks of the river it there is also in our interviews with people we have seen that there is a kind of relationship that they have with the river which they remember so if you talk to people they say that we used to go on this river uh, for uh, x y z you know for doing certain rites now the river is being used as photo shoot for instagram or for weddings right so how do you Uh, and and there are farmers and we interviewed a lot of farmers uh, there and they have a very interesting uh, uh, view of yamuna they say that yamuna is is uh, is polluted but it is smart to us and it will flood it will take away our land so they are sort of used to that idea they are not even thinking of the other ways in which injustice is happening in terms of you know land being taken away for for real estate or building so the people of delhi relate to the river in certain in different points of that 22 km stretch that the yamuna flows in different kinds of ways there are ghats which have a religious uh, significance the nigam bodh ghat and each ghat so so how do we strategically use that nature based solution is not just about ecological things it is also about cultural and social this thing so how do we then leverage those ideas uh, when it comes to uh, the people living on the ghats are also not very rich in that sense and that will help protect uh, that area from any more real estate uh, taking it over so for so the nbs and when it comes to justice again it is the same thing you know it is it seen viewed as something which is you build infrastructure you build some green infrastructure and it will contribute to some ecological solution but why can't it be also that you know existing whatever wherever nature is there in the context of india has so many different relationships why can't they be let it i know religion is a very dodgy argument but then one of the reasons parts of the amna uh, the ghats are protected is because they are the ghats and people go and sit there in the evening and we spoke to them they said that in a city like delhi which has so much hustle and bustle and so many things this is one place where we can come and sit even though the city the water stinks and uh, uh, so so how do we how do we rethink nbs for indian cities very very contextually and convince more than that how do we convince people who have plans for these places to think like that that is i suppose the greater uh, challenge thanks uh, seema i am now going to shift a bit of gear and um, i will uh, i will be asking both chetna and ravi about certain some other aspects of uh, nature in the city so when you know ecologists uh, come into an urbanizing space or an urban space Uh, we tend to look for uh, species and habitats that we have studied elsewhere or uh, or uh, been excited about so in some sense we are seeking ecology in the city the ecology that we are familiar with um, elsewhere right then then you also know as as an ecologist over the years when you start uh, studying uh, uh, the city and urbanizing areas you realize that uh, that the this uh, the combination of uh, built and uh, green spaces blue spaces the complex set complexity and heterogeneity of of cities uh, the noise the, the the lights the the, uh, the pollution so many other things that interact with each other uh, they have uh, very complex impacts on um, on the overall uh, ecology or ecological processes and so on so that becomes like ecology of the city so this is i'm borrowing from the baltimore school of uh, urban ecology uh, to uh, to illustrate this and finally 
we are talking about nature based solutions today we from ecology in the city to ecology of the city we finally then need to think about designing um in some sense constructed ecosystems or designed ecosystems or managed ecosystems and habitats that will also provide solutions for many of our pressing problems in the cities um, that we are going to face are already facing and are likely to face even more in the coming decades and that becomes ecology for the city. So I would put nature-based solutions in, in that third category. Uh, and I just, given that this project which we are doing um, is about greening uh, urban food systems, there are two ways of looking at it. You can, you can try to reduce the impact of, uh, of, of food systems and food consumption in the, uh, in the city, within the city, on ecosystems and agroecosystems elsewhere. So there's a you know, linkage between sustainability elsewhere and, and sustainability within the city. But that is not the within the purview of, the, of our current endeavor. It's about greening food that is, uh, that is grown or can be grown within the city, which also then lends itself to connections with biodiversity, water, and other, other things. So that becomes like an uh, ecology for the city. And so I would like uh, Chetna and Ravi to uh, to sort of um, uh, tell us more about what are the opportunities for us to to in some sense fashion the um, the nature of cities as well as the as as well as the city's relationship with nature um, by fostering uh, uh, in this this. Uh, you know, in some sense, a emerging ecology, looking at uh, cities as an as a novel ecosystem, as a as a place where nature need not always be in retreat, where actually we can we can uh, restore some aspects of nature and maybe even make it a refugia for uh, for biodiversity. So I just want your thoughts on 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 this uh, on what are what are the challenges and the opportunities that we have uh, in in a city. I think this is very interesting. Um, and I absolutely agree with you, Jagdish, that um, cities are very interesting and uh, they definitely give you a very um, a bunch of unique opportunities to um, you know, pick research questions from. And um, I think uh, maybe we should look at what makes cities um, unique in that aspect, because um, Yes, there is the traditional view that, you know, there are these nature reserves and there are these um, non-city areas where you assume that biodiversity is much better off. Um, and I think many of uh, many of us might be wondering, why do we really want to conserve biodiversity in cities? Like, you know, look at this busy city, Bangalore. I mean, conserving in Bangalore, is that really the best way to go about it? But I think uh, what is becoming apparent now is the fact that uh, cities are expanding rapidly and if we were to believe the reports that you know um, uh, are coming then in in the next I think by 2030 the population of um, the city population is really going to almost increase by a huge margin and that's in just the next seven years so um, what I think we have to accept is that um, these pristine urban green uh, sorry pristine um, non-urban green patches are really shrinking and um, cities are growing. So if you really want to um, conserve biodiversity, you have to start thinking about doing it within the city. Um, at the same time, I think uh, the fact that biodiversity in the city um, is what we're interested in, uh, gives us lots of uh, unique opportunities that we wouldn't have otherwise. I mean, um, if you're looking at, um, say, um, city biodiversity, you'd be looking at things like insects, maybe birds, um, small amphibians, and such creatures. And uh, these uh, these live right around us. We're all very, we're familiar with them to an extent and uh, we share spaces with them. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for uh, getting people interested. And that's sort of essential if you are to do anything in the city um, and make it, um, you know, sustainable. So I think um, getting people in these citizen science sort of um, projects is uh, one step in that sense, because you are right there. And if you're monitoring what's going on in your backyard or in your garden or in your neighborhood park, 
then that's something everybody can do. Uh, it doesn't take um, anything um, uh, too uh, too complicated or too much effort or you don't need to go to a nature reserve to study, uh, you know, your species of interest and you can just um, just basically look out of your window or look at look at your garden closely enough and that will give you a lot of very interesting information. Um, it's also true that a lot of uh, this sort of uh, interest comes from, um, uh, you know, Western uh, countries. Um, so yes, it's true. A lot of these studies of uh, biodiversity in cities, uh, especially bees, and I'm sure uh, it's true for other taxa as well. I'm sure uh, Ravi could tell us more about that. Um, it's from um, non-Indian context. So I think that's uh, that's the challenge here. So we definitely need some basic research to see what's going on right here in our cities, in our um, backyards, in our gardens. And um, I think um, this is the unique opportunity that uh, greening urban spaces presents, that um, you, you need to involve people. You can involve people. People are not con uh, constrained. You get um, human resources very easily, you know, so to say. So uh, I think um, any effort to bring about a sustainable um, um, greening of a city needs to sort of take into account the people um, who live there and how best we can use uh, that energy and that resource to take this forward. Yeah. Thanks, Chetna. Uh, Ravi? Yeah, hi, Chetna. Hi, hi. So as you rightly pointed out that uh, the biodiversity in the cities is under tremendous pressure and there is a loss of green cover and the patches of even like whatever forests or um, green patches that are there are shrinking which is causing the habitat to get more and more fragmented um, but like uh, uh, to consider like some um, simple nature-based solutions that can help biodiversity. Uh, since I work on butterflies and I have more experience um, um, in their ecology, I would like to point out that like something like a simple open plot, uh, which is left vacant, if it's allowed um, to like grow with native plants and flowering plants, it helps uh, not only butterflies, but bees, migratory birds that seek shelter. Uh, and as uh, Parma was saying that uh, the rooftop gardens um, are also included in nature-based uh, solutions. Uh, so if these spaces that are already there in the city, which are vacant or um, can be used in a better way, if we plan uh, and... Uh, plant the host plants of these butterflies or nectar plants uh, of these butterflies that will help uh, in maintaining their populations. And um, all these butterflies, bees, they are uh, pollinators of the food crops, um, like especially tomatoes and like a lot of uh, plants in the Solanaceae uh, family are dependent on uh, cross pollination and bus pollination which happens by these insects so if these um, green areas are maintained and are managed uh, properly in the sense of uh, like proper planting of native plants or uh, um, nectar plants for butterflies and bees then they can also help in pollination and uh, help the urban gardening uh, thing so yeah, that's my take on it. Uh, other thing, what Chetna was saying that involving citizens, um, uh, like uh, I have been doing a project on uh, how extreme weather events are affecting uh, butterfly behavior. So in that, we are trying to involve uh, students and researchers and nature enthusiasts so that they can go and collect and observe um, these butterflies uh, in their own backyards and uh, collect some data and contribute to the science uh, that we are doing. So this not only generates interests uh, uh, among 
the people but also helps build that connection with nature which is i feel most important right now thanks uh, ravi so um, i'm going to go into one other aspect of uh, uh, urban ecology conservation restoration or uh, nature based solutions so a uh, few some months back i happened to be in a conversation with the folks in the baltimore school of urban ecology one of the pioneers in in the western world of, uh, in in terms of of starting the area of urban ecology from its infancy decade some decades back and when i used the term global south and global north uh, i was challenged uh, they mentioned how heterogeneous uh, cities and, and urbanizing spaces are across even the global north or for that matter even across the global south not just in biophysical terms but also in terms of of socio economic governance many uh, in terms of of uh, their environmental histories their other uh, social aspects cultural aspects so uh, so the uh, you know um, and also the how nature fits in in each of these so that got me thinking about whether uh, when when we have these boxes called global north global south um, how does that apply uh, to uh, to say for example the way in which we deal with uh, nature based solutions or even look at this issue both in terms of research as well as practice um, so i would like parama um and uh, sima and anybody else who wants to uh, to contribute to dwell on this aspect of whether there is actually a um a, a new concept or a framework we need for nature based solutions that is uniquely in the global south or is it that that we are in some sense uh trying to uh to sort of uh, uh, make these uh, buckets that perhaps may not actually hold all the different uh, cities and towns and and experiences uh, in in these two buckets and we probably need to go beyond them or or do you think that we do have uh, a a space for thinking about this separately in the for the global south Should I go first Rama go ahead so sure. um that's a difficult one uh, my first response is maybe uh, to think about this i mean that's that's my first sort of reaction to to the question um i feel like maybe uh, we can think about this at two levels of, of theory and practice in the sense that um uh, when we theoretically think about some of the things that is relevant uh, in terms of nature based solutions i feel like there are things that we can uh, talk about that works commonly for the global south versus global north and of course there are also things that are uh, relevant for both and maybe uh, if i give an example that would make a bit more sense um fortunately i've had the opportunity to work on uh, urban greening initiatives in different geographic contexts so um, i was in denmark for a period of time where uh, you know the planning agencies often used to depend on urban greening strategies community gardens as ways of uh, pushing for urban redevelopment and they were looking at these uh, nature based solutions as a way of uh, developing social cohesion building a good relationship between different types of population that live there uh, those neighborhoods were essentially uh, mixed neighborhoods with of course danish people but also a lot of homeless people living there uh, a lot of uh, pakistani and turkish immigrants living there so they were re really looking at these community gardening initiatives from the point of view of uh, greening the city but also as uh, as some ways of sort of addressing these uh, cultural social requirements of building social cohesion in the neighborhood and and that's where uh, once again uh, my research sort of highlighted the fact that while the process followed there is a bit more just just in the sense that planners take a bit more care of speaking to the homeless people of involving them in the planning process and therefore trying to come up with a design of uh, the urban gardens that would make sense for them but at the same time the same sort of uh, you know 
injustice that we would probably expect or we often see in in the context of the global south also got highlighted there because we saw in in so many different instances that uh, the planners ultimately made sure that the homeless people were not allowed to come to the garden at the same time when others would so there were small things like that that sort of highlighted uh, that in the process of designing and planning for nature-based solutions, the kind of injustice or inequality that we, we were just talking about uh, a bit earlier applies to different social uh, geographic contexts as well. It, we cannot bucket it and say that you know these things happen more so in the global south versus uh, the global north. Um, so that is one thing. The, and the reason I said that maybe you know theoretically speaking, some of the things... Um, should be sort of clubbed that way on a practical grounded field when you think about implementing specific NBS. I think that's where a lot of nitty gritty details are concerned. And maybe that's when we have to be a bit more careful about not just clubbing everything as global south and global north, because as you said, every city doesn't matter whether it's in the global south or the global north. There's a lot of uh, small, small differences that would make a uh, difference in terms of how it's going to have an implication for different population and also in terms of the impact uh, the nature-based solution would have. So I think my my answer to that question would be that it's, uh, it's not easy, but at the same time, uh, we need to sort of think about, uh, you know, especially when it comes to implementation of projects, we need to uh, probably sort of get out of that uh, that system of clubbing everything simply as global south versus global north. Thanks, Parama. Now, uh, um, Seema? Uh, yeah, just, sorry, my net connection is on and off, so I've just turned off my video for a bit. Uh, so I, I want to be a little uh, it, uh, pushy or controversial and say that, just like Parama said, at a there's a theoretical level and there's a practical implementation level of NBS. At a theoretical level, I think the, as cities in the Global South, we need to reclaim this idea because nature-based solutions have been a part of daily life of uh, people in the global south whether it is uh, things like uh, kitchen gardens which is now uh, being projected as uh, 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 you know certain kind of gardening in the west or if it is uh, urban foraging which is urban foraging is done by every other uh, person from a certain uh, from the from a, especially from the disadvantaged community so it is something that is happening and i think we should claim it back as these are solutions that were happening and you've given a word for it. That is at the theoretical level. But at a practical uh, level, these are words that appeal to uh, people who plan and people in policy. They love these words. So then in which case, we just have to use them. Like if we were looking at the smart cities documents, so much of the uh, uh, information or the language there is is what was seen in the context of Western cities or the reference uh, will be uh, uh, for, we want to make this water body in Shimoga like the Chengongyang stream in Seoul or some other. So these are the kind of aspirations that policies and planners have. So at a theoretical, uh, at a practical level, we could use this language of NBS uh, because it may, it may be a common ground to talk with policy and uh, planners who refuse to see that the global south has a very different uh, uh, context uh, from the global north uh, in terms of city planning. And, but at a theoretical level, as, as researchers who are working on NBS in the global south, we should say, look, we have been doing this. Uh, people in cities have been doing this at a, at, and these things have been happening not only at an individual scale, but also at a city scale. We could just document around uh, what we need is more documentation and proof. The, the Calgary wetlands was just serendipity that we found out. But I'm sure there are a, uh, there are several other instances in different cities which shows of nature has been performing solutions for cities simply because we have not invested in infrastructure like the West for it. So why should we say that you know the the this is a concept of nature-based solutions is something that the West is or the global north is introducing uh, here? We should just say, look, it's been happening all this while. It has been relevant to us. We need more focus and more uh, investment in this uh, from 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 the government. So that is my <laughs> I mean my take on it from reading it because at some level sometimes when I do 
read the literature on NBS, it seems uh, very. Uh, uh, I don't know what to say that you know. It seems like it's it's a it's an idea that the North has come up with. It's not really so. It's everyday practice for many people in the global south. At least uh, I don't know about the ecology like bees and uh, uh, that is an interesting way of looking at it. We are owls as rodent controllers, but as, but at a city scale planning level, yes, these things have been happening. So I'll stop at that. Thanks, uh, Seema. Uh, so again, I'm now going to um, shift gears a little bit. And um, um, so, you know, this, the AFD supported project is about greening uh, urban food systems and linked to uh, urban biodiversity and nature-based solutions. So um, I basically was wondering, what is the experience we have from a city like Bengaluru? Uh, because, you know, there are there are uh, folks who probably are engaging with green spaces in one way or the other, not just the you know in their balconies and and in their uh, in their uh, green space in in their apartment dwellings or or, or other types of settlements, uh, access to urban parks. Uh, there are Bengaluru has a lot of lakes. Um, we also have uh, a wealth of trees, both uh, native as well as uh, exotic. Um, and you um, have, um, uh, you know, in some sense, uh, you do have uh, people who uh, are benefiting from from uh, from these in one way or the other, whether it's the shade from a tree or maybe uh, aesthetically, culturally, you'll see lots of uh, people in banyan trees in many of our uh, temples in the city. Um, you find you find uh, even you know graveyards and other uh, also having green spaces. So there seems to be quite a bit of of of, uh, of um, opportunity for uh, combining urban biodiversity conservation with the use of of spaces by people. So I'm I'm just you know you have been around the city. You have seen uh, the uh, how urban biodiversity is um, either um, in, in some cases shrinking or in some cases maybe benefiting from, from these spaces. And also um, also we have a campuses across Bengaluru, which are got, at least the land use is a little bit more stable over time. And, and there's a greater opportunity to actually fashion those in terms of being becoming more friendly to uh, biodiversity. So what are the, you know, what are the some of the low hanging fruit that you can you think that we can um, engage with in uh, in actually um, enhancing biodiversity in the city uh, with with the help of of various types of uh, citizens? So I know this is a tough question, but but uh, uh, I, both of you have a lot of experience working with different taxonomic groups. You are familiar with the city, uh, so um, hopefully uh, we will be able to generate some ideas for us to move forward. Um, yes, so um, I think um, we were uh, as a research group we were very keen on uh, uh, you know finding out what works for this city. Because, um, you know, as we discussed previously, every city is pretty unique. And um, it I don't think it makes too much sense to club um, areas as, you know, the global north or the global south, although they would have similarities, of course. I think uh, if you're talking about um, ecology and biodiversity especially, uh, it's really important that you look at um, the locality, the region, and uh, smaller scales, basically. Um, I'm sure um, anybody who's you know studied um, a, a taxa which has limited mobility uh, would agree that um, the local landscape is sort of all important. So um, I think it's very important that we, um, um, like Parama mentioned earlier, take note of the nitty gritties and um, tailor our uh, you know NBS or research um, um, in uh, accordance with um, you know cultural. Uh, um, you know, norms as well. And um, uh, so um, I'll talk very briefly about the study that we did um, within Bangalore. Um, so we were very curious to know um, how dependent we are on uh, pollinators. And uh, this, this is because um, whatever information we have for uh, questions like this come from um, places that are very far away and that societies which are very different, diets which are very different. Um, so um, 
a few years ago, we uh, did this online survey to see uh, what we at Bangaloreans eat and uh, how important uh, various foods are in our diet and which of these foods uh, need pollinators. So um, it, was a, it was a fun study and um, we found that uh, lots of staples um, are extremely pollinator dependent and uh, something like uh, close to a little more than a half of diets of Bangaloreans depend on pollinator mediated foods. And this is a pretty conservative estimate. And if you account for uh, more indirect um, um, you know, dependencies on pollinators, this figure would only go up. So we see that a lot of, um, uh, lot of fruits, vegetables, and um, uh, especially spices and oils that are consumed in the city um, are pollinator dependent. So um, uh, this is again uh, interesting from this urban gardening kind of um, perspective. So we followed the survey with um, another survey which spoke about what do we, uh, you know, Bangaloreans or, um, you know, Bangalore folk like to grow in our gardens. Um, so I think um, this was another uh, very um, interesting study. Uh, we see that a lot of people grow flowers and a lot of people grow these um, greens. So I think uh, there's this unique opportunity, uh, and there's this opportunity in Bangalore where people already have uh, this culture of growing edibles in their garden. Uh, people have garden space and people are also um, creatively using space when they don't have, uh, you know, like um, grounded property or anything like that. So a lot of people said that they were using balconies. A lot of people said um, they were also growing edibles on the rooftops. So um, uh, this was uh, this was a good sign, and I think uh, it talks of uh, the really high scope that a city like Bangalore has for uh, you know um, scaling up these nature based solutions pertaining to um, urban agriculture. And uh, what was also sort of most heartening uh, was the fact that. A lot of people who didn't have um, edible gardens wished a very strong interest in starting one. And I think uh, an overwhelming 80% wanted to um, wanted to take it up. So I think um, Bangalore has a lot of uh, scope in this, um, in this angle. Thanks, Chetna, for that optimistic note. Ravi? So, yeah, so, Jagdish, yeah. you mentioned that uh, there are a lot of green spaces and big campuses on Bangalore, uh, like in Bangalore. And what could be the low hanging fruit that can be like achieved uh, with uh, using nature-based solutions. So I have one very small point to make that, uh, like a paper came out last year, um, which studied bird species across educational campuses in India. And, uh, it found that uh, many of uh, like endemic species or even migratory species are using the uh, green spaces or large campuses. And uh, FRI campus in Dehradun had some 300 uh, plus species. And uh, uh, ISC in Bangalore also has a close to 140, 140 spe uh, 150 species of birds. Uh, so one thing uh, that can be done on these campuses or in green spaces is putting up nest boxes. Like I gave an example of the owl box because um, uh, there is a lot of uh, like misunderstanding about owls and um, even bats that uh, they are a bad omen or uh, they spread diseases. And uh, that's why they like uh, they are shooed away from uh, like the residents areas but if these educational campuses or even uh, in green areas if we provide these artificial net nest boxes or bat boxes for them to roost and nest then it will definitely help the urban biodiversity uh, in a lot of ways uh, thanks Ravi uh, now I just want I will have one last uh, question for the panelists and everybody is welcome to to contribute and then after that i think uh, uh Nicole will probably we'll have to open it up to uh, questions from from the uh, participants um so, uh, one is about you know this is about tolerance for 
biodiversity. And there are some forms of biodiversity which are difficult for people to live in close proximity to. I think Apis dorsata, the, the rock bee, you know, when it builds hives which are opposite your balcony or very close to, you, to your house, the tolerance levels really go down. And, you know, the thing is that nothing happens for a long time. They keep out of harm's way. But when something does happen, it's going to be pretty bad. And so it may not be pragmatic to, to, um, to foster that type of uh, coexistence, although there are lots of opportunities in Bengaluru, like very high... Um, you know, watch uh, water towers and other type of structures and even um, greens, larger green spaces, which will always provide habitat for species like the, uh, the rock bee. Uh, but there are other forms of biodiversity for which, you know, tolerance has to be built. They don't really harm us directly. I, you know, there are, there are some issues of, of biofouling and so on. So, you know, or no, or sound. For example, barn owls are tolerated in some places in Bengaluru. In other places, because they screech at night, and 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 so on, um, they 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 are not they are not often tolerated. Uh, also, people have certain taboos and things like that as well. Uh, sometimes people get frightened by looking at a praying mantis or or a spider, uh, which are perfectly harmless. The other thing is that you see in many places in Bengaluru, like uh, each time it rains, you go out and you will see this hundreds of thousands of slugs which have emerged and they just perish on the pavement in apartments because it's, they simply don't have a way of going back to the, the green space from which they came, the soil from where they came. So uh, so there's, there's a lot of the way in which we build our apartments, design our apartments, the way, is there an element of um, tolerance or, or fostering of tolerance that we need, uh, we can we can spread through a network, uh, through a, a awareness and education, uh, so that there's uh, so there are some uh, lots of biodiversity that actually can live very safely with people in the city. Um, and do we also have the opportunity, for example, that we can uh, envision a campus or an uh, environment, a uh, living space where we curb our noise, we we do certain other uh, we do certain other activities slightly differently. So that a bird, a butterfly, or or uh, a bee, or 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 anything else, um, a basking um, a rock agama can actually coexist with us because they're all perfectly harmless, and 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 yet many people are afraid or don't know how to coexist with them or how to change certain habits. Is there an opportunity in this type of space for us to to make a difference? Because there is a, this this can only be scaled up, right? If we, if we can get our message right, we can reach lots of people. So who wants to go first? Ravi, then Chetna and everybody else? So I think uh, there are a lot of opportunities and uh, like, uh, simple things such as uh, taking students or um, the citizens out on nature walks uh, to raise awareness about things and just showing them these things and creating an appreciation about um, uh, like the value that they add to not just uh, human lives but to ecosystems and everything in general. I think that will definitely help in uh, creating that awareness and uh, like co uh, conserving the biodiversity that is there. Chetna? Yes, I agree with what Ravi says. Um, so I just like to quote this study. Uh, of course, it was done in the UK, but I think it's uh, very relevant. So um, they did a study of uh, birds in home gardens. And uh, what they were trying to see was... Um, how happy um, people are to see these birds, what birds make them happy and uh, what don't. And um, what really stood out was that um, uh, the fact that you can recognize a certain bird or name that species really seemed to matter. So I think uh, it's very important to familiarize uh, the general public with, um, with the biodiversity that surrounds them. And uh, of course, it makes sense that you'll be able to appreciate the birds that, you know, visit your garden and do more to encourage uh, other birds that visit your garden. Um, that you can, uh, that you know, that you know what species of bird that is. So that, that's definitely going to make it a lot more interesting for you. So in that sense, uh, that's what we're sort of doing with our bee garden project as well. 
uh, we want to look at what bees exist in Bangalore. And you would think that that is something that is easily known. Um, partly, yes, but not, not fully. Um, so this is, I think, research is needed to see um, really what exists. And you need to take efforts to communicate this to everybody and tell them that these are the uh, species that you can expect to visit you. And that definitely adds in that uh, component of uh, interest or excitement or involvement in uh, conserving those um, those species. And I think um, uh, building building interest in um, various taxa that can very easily coexist with humans in cities is uh, is is the way to go forward. Thanks, uh, Chetna. Uh, Parama, Seema, any thoughts on this aspect of uh, tolerance? From a very uh, personal level, I live inside IIT Madras campus. And, uh, and therefore, in a way, I could say that we do coexist with uh, all kinds of uh, animal species and plants, of course, as well. So starting from, uh, you know, deers, monkeys, uh, two different species of birds. Many of them we don't uh, necessarily recognize. Snakes, scorpions, uh, you know, we are in, oftentimes also in situations where uh, if you're in the, uh, you know, we've always heard stories about living in ground floors and then seeing a snake in the house. Scorpions are very common. Uh, all kinds of insects, bats. Uh, I feel like, honestly speaking, one of the things that uh, we often do here on campus is that there are a few people who are very passionate about biodiversity and they do take our children out for nature walks in campus. Uh, that sort of also exposes them at a very early age to uh, not just start identifying species, but also learn how to uh, you know, behave and how to tackle themselves if they um, and at the same time, we are also informed that in case of any uh, case of uh, you know snake bite or scorpion bite, uh, you can you should be going to the hospital. Uh, all the sort of uh, remedies are there, uh, things like that. I honestly feel like the only way that we can learn to coexist. Uh, we don't appreciate nature when we see it around us. Uh, the best way to coexist and, and learn to coexist is really through education. Uh, it's fascinating to hear these people talk about all these different species of bees. We, at least I had no idea. So uh, I think education and awareness building is, is the way to go. Seema? Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree with what Parama is uh, saying that... Uh, Children are a very critical, uh, if you can call them an electorate for uh, trying to uh, reconnect with nature, uh, but but also parents, because one thing we are seeing increasingly is that it's the fears and of the parents that are transferring to the uh, children. So I remember in one of our uh, talks, a mother came up to me and she said, uh, I'm very worried, I want a solution. My son, she lives in an apartment complex and she said, my son spends all his time on the tree. There's one tree on the campus, one tree on in the apartment block. So I was a bit surprised. I said, so that's a great thing. Like he's, uh, but yeah, but he's just sitting on the tree and watching and doing nothing. And I thought, and he was about nine years old, if I remember. Uh, so it is the parents' perception that that is, that is not something that is a good thing to do. That's probably stopping a lot of other uh, children from doing it as well. But there's absolutely nothing wrong in sitting on a tree watching the ants or the birds. So, uh, with along with children and parents, need to take that time out to take children in the weekends, spend at least one evening uh, in the weekend, take them out to a local park. If if we look at our own experiences as children, what stands out for me personally is uh, summer vacations spent in ancestral house in Kerala. Uh, playing in a park in which many children don't get to do now because they're even the play is regulated you go from six to seven for tennis or seven to eight from uh, this thing. there is no informal engagement with uh, nature it's always it has to be a regulated registered walk because the informal engagement with nature is seen as dangerous or causing us uh, but it, it shouldn't be, you know, and, and it's very rare to see parents now simply telling the child, okay, you can go get wet in the rain and go just get muddy, it's okay. 
it's very, very rare. So I think parents themselves have to change the mindset. And for that, outreach and education is really the only way. We find parents to be a much difficult uh, uh, group to uh, convince than children. Yeah, thanks, Seema. And, and just to mention that if you look at the uh, how many uh, important concepts in biology, physics, and chemistry can actually be understood uh, through uh, by observing things in, in nature, both in both whether it's locomotion of insects or birds or or, or uh, feeding, foraging, uh, many other phenomena. So many things are there which can actually help our uh, education um, and maybe make many of these subjects a little bit more interesting for at least middle school, um, certainly. Uh, so now I'm going to... Um, to take up some of the questions that I can see uh, received from our online participants. Thank you for being patient and waiting. So there's a question uh, for Seema uh, from uh, Sai Gule. Uh, is it possible to use nature-based solutions in the city of Mumbai to prevent urban flooding? So that's a tough one, but uh, uh, Seema, that's a question for you. Uh, so historically itself, Mumbai, the entire, it, it was a seven, sister seven islands that have been reclaimed to become one uh, city right and uh, every possible mistake with regard to the topography of mumbai has already been made uh, but if we have to prevent flooding of course there are some basic maintenance things that we're talking about the the water networks the miti rivers and there are many small ponds uh, that you hear, like Bandra has a pond, uh, there's a Banganga pond system in another part of Bombay. So these all need to be seen as uh, places which can store and stock uh, water. And, and for heaven's sake, please stop reclaiming more land. We have reclaimed as much land from Bombay to create Bombay. The seven islands of Bombay have been created reclaiming all that. Uh, please do not reclaim any more. Let the creeks be as they are. Let the mangroves exist. Let the biodiversity that is existing there be there. So it's basically stop doing more of what you're doing now, is essentially, and keep the creeks and the channels uh, uh, clean. Uh, thanks, Seema. There's another question from Priya Joshi, and this is for Chetna. Um, in this study survey, uh, about Bengaluru, what Bengaluru eats and how dependent it is on pollinators. Is this available for reference? We are keen to understand it in the context of our work. Thank you. Um, thanks for asking, Priya. Um, so it's still unpublished data as of now, but I'd be very happy to um, you know, give you some information that we have. So maybe you could just write to me. Um, I'll share my email ID in the chat box. Thanks, Chetna. Uh, Swarnika, any other questions or any other things that we have from the participants? Uh, no, Jagdish. But thanks a lot, Jagdish, and all the participants for such a rich discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Thank thanks, you. Chetna, Parama, um, Thank you. Seema and Ravi, and all the uh, participants uh, who uh, spent so much time this afternoon or morning or evening, depending on where you are from, with us. And this is uh, uh, something that we would like to take forward. It can only grow as a network and uh, by exchanging information and knowledge and sharing both research and practice and, and then making it into a, a, a movement uh, of not uh, of citizens and of uh, joint initiatives with government and other uh, entities. So let us hope that, uh, that when a few years from now, if we discussing this, we'll have a lot more positive stories uh, and optimism to share with each other. Thank you, everybody.